Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the New Space Conference. For our opening keynote, we'll be joined by Eric Stalmer, president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. He has an impressive set of experiences in government, having served as the vice president of government relations at AGI and on Capitol Hill in the office of Congressman Tim Burton. For the past two decades, Eric Stalmer has served as a logistics officer in the United States Army and Army Reserves. Please welcome Eric Stalmer. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to Hannah and Jeff for putting on this conference. I know how much work goes into these things, and, and so far it's been just, uh, just off the hook so far, and, and a great turnout, and, and just really a great lineup, so I'm really, really happy to be here. I was at a conference yesterday in Washington, uh, the Future Space Leaders, and they had four members of Congress um, speak at the event, and they all had a big, thick stack of papers like this, uh, and every one of them went off script and didn't follow the speech that they, they had prepared. Um, and in so doing, said things like, well, we got to cut down the amount of uh, these commercial, commercial crew vehicles to a lower number. You know, I think we've done that. I think we're down to two now. So um, from advice from uh, council and staff, I'm going to stick to my script a little bit and talk to you about uh, what we're doing here at CSF and, uh, and hopefully answer any questions you have uh, at the end. But that being said, here, and uh, I hope most of, all, most of you here are aware of what uh, CSF is doing. And those of you are not, CSF is a trade association representing the commercial space organizations in Washington, D.C. We want to make it easier for you, the operators, the providers, and suppliers, and researchers to continue operating and flourishing in the United States. We're constantly talking to the legislature, legislators and decision makers on behalf of our members and bringing the industry together as one voice. Whether we're sharing the best practices with the industry or reaching higher levels of safety or working to make a commercial human space flight a reality, we're here for you. And we're growing fast. We've now surpassed 60 member companies, organizations, and educational institutions. Among our ranks, we count orbital companies like SpaceX, Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, Bigelow Aerospace Orbitals with the likes of Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, uh, NX Core Aerospace. And we have our suppliers, our orbital, uh, orbital outfitters, and resource utilization companies like Planetary Resources, Spaceflight Industries, and Moon Express. And we have our spaceports. Yeah, every, uh, every, seems like every day we're growing new spaceports, which is great to see the interest. We have Cecil Field in, in Jacksonville, Mojave, Spaceport America, Midland now, uh, and the newly christened Houston Air and Spaceport. And finally, our university affiliates, uh, such as Arizona State University, Penn State, Applied Research, Metropolitan State University of Denver, Emory-Riddle University, and these are just a few. And we're all working together here. We all know that commercial human space flight is not and being a trade association, uh, as CSF is, we've risen to that challenge. A lot of people criticize special interest groups. I take great pride in being a special interest group. I like to say we're a very, very special interest group. In our building in Washington, we, ha we have many different trade associations in there. We have the, uh, the Ready, Ready Mix Cement Contractors of America. We have the American Railroad Association. We even have an organization in there called the, 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 SNA, the National Automatic Merchandising Association. And the perks that working at NAMA, well, that's free soda and potato chips. And their big challenging issues are maybe when the honey bun gets stuck against the glass and that big burly guy starts shaking the machine. Those are the type of issues that we have. But not us. Not us. We choose a commercial space industry, uh, the best and most challenging of industry of all. And we want the perks of our job to be the opportunity for all of us and everyone else to go and have the benefit of space and space exploration. And the benefits from outer space and exploration are threefold, I feel. It's education, educational, economical, and inspirational. First, educational. The commercial space industry is creating thousands of high-tech jobs in the US. 
In addition, this sector is creating in a renewed interest in the STEM careers of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The industry is exciting, and the next generation is allowing them to participate in the nation's journey into space. With the new commercial space platforms, students can build and fly their experiments into space or on suborbital platforms or build and launch their own satellites and fly experiments to be tested on the International Space Station. Inspiring the next generation is inspiring the future problem solvers and the entrepreneurs that will shape our lives in the coming years to come. As Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon and another company we're interested in, Blue Origin, so eloquently put it, Millions of, were, of people were inspired by the Apollo program. He was five years old when he watched the Apollo 11 unfold on television, and without any doubt, as he said, it was the biggest contributor to for science and engineering and exploration. Education is the most fundamental, in, in, its, mon, in its most fundamental form, is about tapping into children's passion through the window of inspiration. And just like a window directs the sun's energy into a room to illuminate, what was once dark, so does the window of inspiration direct a child's energy to illuminate its mind. For some of us, not all, I know it's called but for some, Apollo 11 was that window. And now, the commercial space industry has become that window of inspiration for a generation who will change the world in ways that we can't even begin to imagine right now. The economic impact is enormous. The global space economy is worth over $330 billion right now. That's billion with a B. There's at least a thousand commercial space companies worldwide. And newsflash, we're still growing. Imagine the complexion of the industry in 20 years or 10 years. Heck, even forward next year, what it'll be and what it'll look like. In an FAA report, uh, cleverly titled The Economic Impact of Commercial Space Transportation on the U.S. Economy, the FAA analyzed data, economic data from 1999 to 2009. In that decade, do you know what they found? They found that the commercial space industry's in economic activity grew by over 340%. 340% by 2009, and we didn't even have the commercial crew program. I only expect that number to grow higher if they have economic data now as we continue to grow. On top of all this, the space industry inspires us. We've sent astronauts back and forth to low Earth orbit and beyond and to the moon. And now we've sent probes to every planet in our solar system. We fuel the fire of adventure in billionaires, doctors, scientists, students, lawyers, and even children. And why? Because we dream big. I have an unyielding confidence in our industry because I dream, dream big myself. This confidence is forged with the privilege that I have every day of working with over 60 members progressing thoroughly throughout this process. And they've been pretty busy over the past year. I'd just like to highlight a few of these. SpaceX, while they did recently have that, that mishap, they'll learn from that experience, improve and fly again, and fly again rather quickly, I'm, I'm sure. They're improving themselves through testing new capabilities and getting very close to recapturing the first stage, opening up the door for re fully reusability. Over the past 12 months alone, SpaceX has had nine successful flights in a historic track with the CC1 program, and we're looking forward to them topping that number in the next 12 months to come. Blue Origin had its first successful test flight in new, the New Shepard, taking that rocket up over 307,000 feet. But even more impressingly and more amazing about all that, they allowed us to see that in real time. x is feverishly working to complete the links having just recently bonded the support stakes and chosen matrix composites for the development of the chines for their spacecraft. They're also making impressive progress on their advanced facilities at the Midland Air and Spaceport. Virgin Galactic just announced their own contract with OneWeb to perform over 39 launch satellite launches, one of the largest satellite launch contracts ever uh, in the history of the industry. VG has also achieved a weight on wheels for the first time with the second Planetary Resources have sent one spacecraft to the ISS and will be launching its next, the ARC spacecraft, near Thanksgiving, just having completed the vibration testing uh, of the spacecraft in June. Orbital Outfitters is hard at work constructing a facility and altitude chamber at the Midland International Air and Spaceport. 
And I know Jeff and his team is busy with a lot of other things going on out there and, and promoting Midland. And that being said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Midland, Texas, and Ellington Field in Houston have become the nation's ninth and tenth commercial spaceports. Planet Lab recently secured $118 million for financing and also signed a partnership with Progea to uh, map Poland from space. And I think just yesterday they announced that they've entered into agreement to acquire Blackbridge Corporation, a uh, leading geospatial intelligence imaging company that owns rapid constellation and its archive of five millimeter satellite data. Sierra Nevada, another member company, continues to work progress on their Dream Chaser vehicle and, and continues their flight testing at NASA's Armstrong Research Center. Maston Space System, a team of only 20 people, have passed the 350 uh, launches per year mark and is making impressive progress on three really high profile programs. Phase one for DARPA's experimental space program, space plane, XS-1, a partnership with NASA's Lunar Catalyst program, and frequent reliable campaigns with NASA's STMD's Flight Opportunities Program, which I'd like to talk a little bit about later. Spaceflight Industries announced just learn that we have to dial the phone too and, and get in touch with the media and tell them our stories. And there's great representatives of the media here and in the industry that are really yearning to tell our story. And I really encourage you to get out there and do it. I see one of my favorites in the back, who's an animal on Twitter and with Space News. He's really telling our story. And there's so many others out there that are telling the story of commercial space. We need to keep that up. So with all this good news, we have the policy that goes along with our, our challenges. In parallel with the technical challenges we face and will continue to face in the future, there's challenges of policy and regulation. Policies and regulation have the power to inhibit us, but they also have the ability to empower us and to help our industry flourish. Reauthorizing the Commercial Space Launch Act, or the CSLA, is a perfect example of those challenges and partnerships. The CSLA was originally passed in 1984. It was amended in 88 and again in 2004. And we're, we're working to have it reauthorized this year. We're actually working right now as of a call this morning at 6.30 to get the Senate off their tail to, uh, to pass the bill. This, believe it or not, the House is, uh, has done their job about a month and a half ago. And, uh, and the Senate is ready to go. It just needs it to bring it to the floor. But reauthorizing the CSL would bring a number of benefits to the commercial space industry. For a moment, I just want to focus on three of these areas uh, in the bills. First is extension of the learning period and third-party risk sharing or indemnification and permit flexibility. The learning period was cr created in 2004 to enable the commercial space industry to develop creative spacecraft solutions for space flight. Test those spacecraft and collect data, analyze and validate the systems, as well as apply that data to building better future iterations of spacecraft. As you can tell from my last sentence, this is not an overnight process, but we are making progress and several companies have recently begun test flights and others working towards that goal relatively soon. So we're learning, so the learning period is just getting underway, not coming to a close, and we need to educate folks on that. And really, the learning should never end. Do you stop learning when you graduate from college? Personally, I know I wouldn't be standing here if I did. So it's not a surprise that we're working to extend the learning period to continue to work and pass the industry consensus standards, and if necessary, at some point in the future, ensuring that potential regulations are a result of actual data 
rather than just speculative analysis by lawmakers. Moving in this direction also begs the question of what happens when it occurs and a third party is negatively affected. The commercial space industry is required by law to purchase insurance up to a certain amount decided by a government risk calculation to protect against third party liability claims in the case of an accident. And for the past 27 years, the government through a tiered system has partnered with industry to share the, above, share the risk above the private insurance threshold and below a certain ceiling, helping the risk, also known as indemnification. Even though the U.S. government has never had to pay out for claims related to third-party risk-sharing regime, it constantly has to be reauthorized, something other launch competitive nations don't have to worry about. In addition, many other spacefaring nations have much stronger risk-sharing regimes than the United States. By strengthening the U.S. risk-sharing regime, commercial space companies will be on an equal, equal playing field to compete against its other international launch providers. Lastly, permit, permit flexibility will be a necessity for the commercial space industry, just as it was for the commercial airline industry many years ago. Currently, once a space vehicle is licensed, it cannot move backwards to the experimental permit phase. Allowing this flexibility would enable more new technology to be more easily and quickly implemented, such as alternate propulsion or safety systems. Companies would have the option to keep optimizing their vehicles in a safe testing environment while keeping their business operational, which would act as a catalyst for industry growth. The proposed reauthorization of the CSLA is about ensuring partnership with government and industry continues, and to enable innovation and economic growth rather than hindering it. Congressional leaders see the importance of this sector's growth and are committed to adopting policies that will enable continued expansion, making commercial space activities a key part of the economic vision for America. The proposed House and Senate bills are very good real, very good real world applications of public-private partnerships, having the industry working with the government to preserve the U.S. leadership in space and extend the Earth's economic sphere and create safe, reliable techn technologies to reduce the cost of access to space. Some of these technologies are also getting support from NASA in the form of the Flight Opportunities Program and the Advanced Exploration Systems. CSF has long uh, promoted the many benefits from the NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. It enables suborbital and high altitude atmospheric research plat platforms critical to the workforce development of our next generation space scientists and engineers, our future Alan Stearns. It enables access to relevant environmental testing, mature, compelling technologies, and research at a small fraction of the cost required for orbital flights, keeping promising technologies to not to be shelved. Prize is a partner with the, space, with the Flight Opportunities Program, flying, just recently flying two university-led experiments to better understand the near space. One day they hope to use a pressurized capsule to ferry passengers up to the edge of space. And I think just recently, Worldview was featured on the cover of Popular Science Magazine. I think that just came out, what, what, what Worldview is doing. Mast in Space Systems uh, recently partnered with Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon University and the Flight Opportunities Program to test technologies on mast in Zombie and a previous Flight Opportunities campaign with NASA's JPL to demonstrate new precision landing capabilities necessary for future missions to currently inaccessible science targets in the hazardous terrains of the moon, Mars, and the jagged icy surface of Europa. Maybe a future partnership with Alan Stern and his Pluto lander is, is in the cards for Mastin. Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 will be used for future flights with NASA's Flight Opportunity Program as well. Uh, NASA just recently announced that the Flight Opportunities Program would part within, partner with industry to test suborbital technologies. Although the program does not provide funding to these companies directly, it does pr provide facilities that NASA and other resources can use for vital flight testings. AES is also an excellent uh, part of its public partnerships to team with industry on capabilities and services to be necessary for beyond low Earth orbit uh, human exploration. By partnering with, with industry, NASA can leverage the additional resources and access capabilities that are much further along in their development. Uh, and development due to years of private sector work. Sorry about that. 
For example, NASA is partnering with Bigelow Aerospace, Aerospace to test advanced expendable habitat, habitation modules by attaching the beam, the Big, Bigelow expandable module, to the ISS later this year. Expandable habitats are believed to provide better crew protection against hazardous micro, uh, micrometeor debris and radiation that traditional hard side modules experience. Part of BEAM's mission will be to test that, those theories out. And Congress has been a very strong supporter of AES and the use of the private-public private partnerships to work closely to ensure that these programs get the resource and guidance that is necessary to continue to make progress. For example, just recently, the Senate approved funding for AES in the, the uh, FY16 budget. And to put these numbers in perspective, the beam cost came out of this budget. It cost about $17.8 million to acquire the first commercial space station module. That's pretty impressive. This still leaves over $210 million for partnerships to acquire commercial landers, surface, uh, surface facilities, and cease landers habitat destinations. This is definitely a big win for the taxpayers and a big bang for, the, for their dollar and for deep space exploration and NASA. While we've, while we've been successful working with Congress to fully fund uh, AES and codify public-private partnerships for beyond low Earth orbit capabilities and, and full funding of the commercial cargo program, as well as increased funding for flight opportunities, we still have more, more work to do. And many of you know where this work lies in the commercial crew program. It's mind-boggling what is going on with the commercial crew program, and we can go into that rationale a little bit later. But, but both the House and Senate appropriation bills underfunded the program by several hundred millions of dollars. I think we know what failing to fund this program will mean in the long term of this program. And I don't even mean the long term. The long term for the commercial crew is 2017. Do we want to continue to be making further payments to Russia, the Russians to provide U.S. human spaceflight to the International Space Station? I personally believe it's an embarrassment, and I really struggle to know uh, what, what the Congress has, is struggling to understand about funding of the commercial crew program, seeing that it is meeting its milestones per the, the uh, public-private partnership. Then we have the, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation budget, which is also of great concern for me. The, the office asked for a mere budget increase of $1.5 billion. Well, did I say billion? $1.5 million. $1.5 million. It's practically unheard of that Congress would worry about $1.5 million budget increase. I work at the Pentagon part-time, thanks to my, my dear friends at the Army, and I truly believe that our coffee budget is $1.5 million. All joking aside, uh, the intent of this money was to hire the much-needed help to meet the growing demands of the licensing, experimental permits, and the safety approvals. I truly believe that no one works harder in Washington than the folks at the, the Office of uh, Space Transportation at the FAA. I applaud their work, and I will continue to fight hard to get their funding, the much-needed funding, $1.5 billion. I think we have interns that could sell uh, lemonade outside some of these buildings to raise that money if need be. But this is a critical time for AST, and working with members of Congress, we have been able to, in the House, we raised that funding level of uh, 250000 and thankfully, the Senate has boosted that number to 750000 above the AST's current budget, but we'll continue to work that. While neither of these are perfect, the booth in both bills represents progress and we're uh, committed to continue to work with Congress to fully fund AST and other budgets. So where, so where do you ask where this money's coming from? I don't know. We'll have to put our crystal ball. But I can give you a little assessment of what we see moving forward. And at this, at this point, it's too early to predict the final fate of the appropriations bill. But with that said, and talking with folks on Capitol Hill, here's what we're hearing mo the most likely scenario. With a, only a handful of legislative days going, and you know how hard they worked in these legislative days, the Congress will likely pass a relatively short-term continuing resolution through the fall. During that time, around October or November, the debt ceiling will need to be raised once again and since the debt ceiling will likely need bipartisan support to be raised, the thought is that the incentive will be in place to force a bipartisan budget summit to raise the current budget caps, clearing the path for passage of the 2016 appropriations bills. Obviously, the situation is very as of now, but that's, that's our hope. I mentioned the two spaceports earlier that I'm extremely excited about. 
the Midland uh, International Airport, which is awarded a space, li space launch operator's license, a spaceport license in essence, which marked the first commercial, space, commercial airport to become a spaceport as well. And Midland now goes by the title Midland International Air and Spaceport. The Houston airport system has also been awarded a spaceport license, becoming the 10th in the nation. And we're very excited to see what they're doing down in Houston uh, and transitioning from the work that NASA has been doing down there. Uh, in addition to what's going on with the, the spaceports, we're working with the Transportation Committee to try to find a small percent of airport funds to help support the infrastructure in building these spaceports. In the future, we, we'll have a fund specifically for spaceports, but we're taking baby steps right now, and we'll get there because we know what, that what the spaceports are doing is looking for the future. At CSF, we strive to be equal parts optimist and also realism. We recognize that not everyone in the industry is going to agree on industry standards and indemnification. But this industry sees the difference between the standards we're working towards implementing and the requirements of the past, where the capsules all look the same and, and disposing of rocket into the ocean was part of the mission. We're on the cusp of a whole new world, pardon the pun. We don't want the standards that are going to say what size exactly your heat shield must be. We don't believe that that allows for the innovation that I know all of you are capable and many of you are already achieving. And the suborbital vehicles are unlike anything that NASA has ever created before. <clears throat> and they're different from the current orbital vehicles. There are doctors and scientists and professors and students and they're innovating new ways of access to space. And we want to do everything in our power to help them succeed. We recognize that consensus, you know the term that everyone is forced to agree on something even though they don't like it, uh, we believe that can be met. We can't promise that we'll fix everything and then make, make Earth all about commercial space, but we will continue to do our best in that area. We want to speak to more organizations. We want to represent greater interests. We want to hear your ideas on, on standards and how we can work to achieve them so the appropriate legislations can be implemented to help this industry thrive. We're growing. As I said now, we have over 60 companies and, and organizations, but this is just one sliver of the industry and we want to grow the industry further. Everyone who is new to the industry can have their voice and can learn from other companies. By working together, we can make human, human, commercial human spaceflight a reality. I'm an optimist. These are not rose-colored glasses that I'm wearing. These are, I'm not wearing any contacts. Uh, these are not some far-flung dream that can easily be blown away from the exhaust fumes from a launch. This is real. We recognize the achievements of our members, but we also cannot help notice that others are succeeding well, and we applaud this. We applaud what One World has done and reached out with Virgin Glass and the launches and all the, the various other companies, um, Google, Qualcomm, Airbus, and Coca-Cola. You know, the, the outer space has moved from Tang and Teflon and expanded into new evolving companies that are traditionally not associated with space activities, and we're thrilled about this. I'm an optimist about the growth and potential of the commercial. I've seen what many of these companies can do. I've personally visited more than ha about 40, 40 of our companies all around the country, and I'm inspired every day and every trip I take to see them. And I know there's hundreds, hundreds more out there that are doing what they're doing. I'm an optimist because I dream big, and I hope all you in this room do as well. I thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to interacting with all of you throughout this conference. Thank you so much.